So welcome to Northern Powerhouses, our business success story series of interviews where we discuss with local business leaders their backgrounds, their successes and challenges and what's really driving them forwards. And this morning, I'm delighted to have with us Stephen Kennedy, who's co-founder and director at Newmore Capital. So Stephen, firstly, thanks for spending a bit of time with us this morning. And if you'd like to introduce yourself and Newmore Cap Capital, what you do, how you do it and how you help people, that would be wonderful. Yep, thank you. Um, so yes, I'm Stephen Kennedy. Uh, I am the co-founder of Newmore Capital, which is a small boutique um, leverage buyout private equity fund that has embarked upon a number of buy and builds in certain sectors. Those sectors are marketing services, predominantly digital marketing, executive search, care homes, and some technology oriented products and services. My background is a corporate, um, both in banking and in the support services sector, where I was a main board director of a FTSE company. Um, I like to consider myself a growth practitioner, not a theorist. Um, so our private equity model that we deploy is one of a funding vehicle as opposed to an ethos of running a business. So okay. we have a slightly different attitude to how we run businesses to what my previous experience of private equity is both good and bad. So I think we've got some failings that, that the what wider private equity industry do a better job at, but I think we've also got some distinct advantages. Brilliant, brilliant. I, I, and I, I'm keen to know what, if anyone listening, what, what those different, those advan advantageous yeah, yeah. things might be. Yeah, so I think we are far more top line growth orientated in my experience, yeah? yeah. Whereas private equity, in the, the general sense is much more about return on investment of which a lot of that centers around cost reduction, restructuring. Right, yeah. EBIT, EBITDA growth through efficiency gains of yeah. which is absolutely a fundamentally important part yeah. of any business improvement plan. But we're about that top line growth, about sales and marketing and the industrialization of sales and marketing because many SMB businesses their sales and marketing strategies is around their network. Yeah. 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 They built networks and those networks drive new business. But yeah. that individual is not an eminently scalable system. Yeah. Yeah. So what we do is we coach in those those scaling systems. But the, the whole premise of private equity buying builds is built around this arbitrage, this when you buy a business, small businesses at four times their profit, yeah, and you yeah. put them all together. Yeah. And you then are able to sell that skill at, say, eight times the profit. Yes. Yeah. That's a very good, sensible model. And we thought, well, what if we could do that? And then overlay that, a top line sales and marketing Brilliant. growth model, wouldn't that be fantastic? Yep. That, wonderful. It, it very much means it to me in, in, in very different ways. It's similar to some of the things that we, or the principles that, that we operate yeah. to. It's that idea of increasing the multiple and increase the profit means increase you, you get a double double yeah. dip on the value on the value of the valuation that's, yeah, that's, yeah. The, that's the idea that of course like most ideas is much more difficult in the execution 100 <laughs> percent, 100 percent. well i love the, the phrase the military i think it's that no no plan survives first contact with the enemy i think is the absolutely yeah, is, 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 is the phrase and, but that's interesting so just so i get this right because i'm really fascinated by this so you describe sort of other um, PE sort of firms looking at perhaps what I would sort of class as, you know, the cash cow. It's already mature, and what we're doing is maximising the profit primarily by reducing costs. Whereas you're taking people through the growth phase that's free cash cow, if you like, free. Yeah, free because because many of these businesses at their size that they're at have micro percentages of the market share. So actually, even with the external markets, and this has been obviously the challenge over the last few years because we've had a very difficult economy. But when you sit at 0.01% of any market, if the market's lost 5%, it should be goddamn irrelevant, right? Because your percentage share is so small in the first place, you just got to steal 0.001% from somewhere else, yeah? And that's within your own internal capability. If you're sat at 10% market share and you've got a very tough economy, that's a hard place to be, right? But entrepreneurs follow that pattern mentally and say, goodness, it's a shit economy. We can't grow. 
Uh, sorry, it's like I have to say it's like like talking to the mirror at the moment because I completely. <laughs> Because <laughs> I, I often say, you know, and literally that I say, look, you know, the worst recessions we ever have rarely get above double digit. They rarely get above ten percent. The worst ones were perhaps twenty, maybe twenty two percent. But but most recessions are only a few percentage reduction, which means you've still got ninety seven percent of the marketplace to go, you know, or ninety percent of the yeah. marketplace. To go. And as you say, most SMEs I work with are less than one percent of the market they could address if they chose to, whether that's geographically. By, by. Yeah. And so growing in a recession is absolutely simple, especially because most of our competition competition aren't doing the marketing, the sales, because they believe they're not going to make any more business. It's actually often a better time to grow yeah. in a recession than not in a recession. Yeah, and look, look at, there's, there's no question sentiment if you're in B2B, which predominantly our businesses are B2B, yep. yeah? Um, then sentiment affects the businesses that you're selling to, and that, in effect, reduces the opportunity. So you have to work harder and smarter to access that opportunity. But interestingly, we, we subscribe to a couple of global selling systems. One's Miller Hyman, the other one's called Rain. Yeah. And yep. Rain do a biannual buyer's guide, 40,000 respondents of all by corporate buyers, from yep. CEOs to procurement officers to the, the, the whole gambit. And those um, those respondents will tell you that when there is a recession, the opportunity for boards and senior managers to do nothing is much less than it is in a very low growth environment, right? So in a high growth environment, you really don't need to be that good because the market's driving your growth. And you can buy the hype all you like, right? And yeah. we've had many in our recruitment industry in particular who have done exceptionally well last year because they came off of a very, very poor prior year. And everyone yeah. thought the hype that that's their new norm, right? Yeah. But when you get into a low growth environment, which was quite frankly where the UK has been for 10 years, yeah? yeah. This country has been low growth for yes. a long time. Yeah. Those are where the, Those are the markets where execs don't need to take risks don't need to take big bold decisions when you hit a recession doing nothing isn't acceptable so more opportunities in my opinion come out in a recession because choice of doing nothing is not there yep. that's the view in rain and i absolutely actually believe that and we we coach that not all entrepreneurs believe it they think we're just trying to manipulate them but it, i think it's true <laughs> i do <laughs> I, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I, I think, I mean, I, I'm going to ask you about quotes later or, or sayings, but I think it was Walt Disney said many, many years ago. He said, I, I think he said something like, I'm being told I'm, I'm being told there's a recession coming, but I'm choosing not to participate. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, it, it's, mentality. it's there's so much opportunity, you know, there always is. And, and often more opportunity in recession than than, than in, in growth spurts. But Definitely. I often find. So just, just sort of going back, we well, sort of, Long term history. What, what when you were growing up? Is this the sort of thing you thought you'd be end, ending up doing, or did you have <laughs> other, other plans at the start? No, no. I mean, look, I God, this is going to sound really very rather boring, but I came <laughs> from a council estate in Glasgow, right? Right. Um, and I could have been a product of my environment had it not yes. been for an extremely powerful woman called my mum. Yeah, really. Who would not accept that the environment that I grew up in was my limitations, yeah? She wouldn't allow me to self-limit. And because most of my friends, their ambitions, with the greatest respect to them, they were all wonderful people, but their ambitions were limited, yeah? Because yeah. their parents and those around them sort of almost encouraged them to accept their lot, yeah? yeah? And I could have quite easily been one of those, but my mother was not having it. So she would really? constantly tell me that I was better than all those other kids, yeah? And really? whether I was or I wasn't, wasn't really the point. The point is that I was willing to get up off my ass and do something different, yeah? yeah? So I always knew that I wanted to be in business. I didn't know in what capacity. I used to buy and sell things when I was a young man. Um, but where that was going to take me, I didn't quite know. I actually started off as a, a clerk in the Royal Bank of Scotland because actually, I was also trying to pacify my father, who was quite risk adverse, and he yeah. was quite proud of the fact that even getting out of not working for the council and working for the bank was in itself, you know, he would tell people, oh, my son works for the bank, yeah, which coming from a council estate was quite unusual. Yeah. Um, 
So, yeah, I know I didn't actually know what specifically I wanted to do. And of course, what I do now, which is I'm effectively an entrepreneur. Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm, although I would consider myself a coach for entrepreneurs, right. Right? but I'm an entrepreneur myself. Most of my career was as a corporate. And actually, those who know me very well, characteristically, you couldn't get someone who was least a fit for corporate life than I, because I'm a maverick. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. <laughs> So how did you, I mean, I'm assuming you had quite a long corporate life. How did you manage? I mean, if you're, you're an entrepreneurial maverick, maverick in a very systemized environment, that's going to that's gonna sting a little bit. <laughs> it has, but then interestingly, um, through good coaching, I was also extremely disciplined and so yep. could fit in the system. Yeah. Um, I often felt I was better than the system, but that was that was the arrogance of youth, Yeah. And, and, and what you realize, and now I coach this message, is that even if you yourself are better than the system, that you have to have the system that the average bear can follow. Yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, if I use large corporate sales teams, which I managed many of, if you've got mavericks who, who within that team who don't follow the sales system, Miller, Hyman, Rain, whatever it is, and you then try and coach those who are less good, they will, of course, tell you, that don't tell me you need to follow the system to be good because yeah. the best salespeople we've got don't follow the bloody system. Yep. Yeah. And they then become, and I was one, you become a net value destroyer, not actually yeah. a net value creator. Your own yeah. personal performance may be exemplary, but because others don't follow the system because you're a bad, um, you're a bad example, you're destroying value. Yeah. 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 I, th I, I think the most effective mechanisms is where we take what those high performers are doing and embed it in the system because often it's not a question of that they're, they're, they're you know it, it's developing the system to, to use Correct. the best but, but without us without a team following a system we don't have the ability to measure and monitor the, the effect that system is having and therefore if we're not doing if we're not consistent then measurement is very difficult isn't it in terms of saying well that works or that doesn't if yeah we're doing yes thing, it, it, we can tell that that person works or that that one doesn't but we can't tell about about systems so going to sort of new more capital, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had um, implementing the the, the, the the structures and the processes that you that, that you put out there? Into the, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there is only really one challenge, and that is people. Yeah, it's <laughs> always. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I saw you know, maybe preempting, but I saw a question on your list that you sent, which is, you know, what's the biggest lesson? The biggest lesson for me in business is looking back and forward always always find better people yeah 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 and yeah. and like another question which is business sayings that i i really believe in and i've got a couple but one's mine but this one isn't which is that people eat strategy for breakfast yeah yes yeah and and i've absolutely believe that you can have the best plan in the world but if yeah. you've got the wrong people executing it yeah yeah you're always going to be suboptimal and, and yes. so the biggest lesson i've learned and the biggest challenge that I thought in business is constantly people, the talent, either developing the current talent or actually removing those who are a block to what's required to be done in, in bringing in new talent. And that's become even more difficult, hasn't it? It's become even more difficult because we have a, an unprecedented market for um, recruitment where, you know, there's this huge loss of people from the marketplace. Yeah, both yeah. through Brexit. And from um, COVID, yeah. I think it's 600,000 additional retirees in one year. Yeah, it's like nine yes. years yes. worth of retirement. Nine years yeah. in yeah. one year. Yeah, add yeah. to that Brexit. And, and we wonder why we've got a productivity challenge and, and we've got a growth issue. And um, so that's made the market even tougher. But you've got to always find better people because better yeah. people in, in any, you know, the best plan in the world Honestly, I take an average plan and fabulous people every day of the week. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. There is a say around that, isn't it? That, that uh, you know, great people with an average plan uh, outshine average people with a great plan. I've said something like that, which I I completely agree. And I heard um, I, I was at an investment event a couple of a couple of weeks ago, and they they had um, one of the there wasn't speakers; it was more Q and A. But they had a, a lady called Jennifer Byrne, who's at the ex CTO for Microsoft. So you know, literally working directly with Bill Gates. And she said a couple of really interesting things. One was um, that, that a team as such is just a construct. It's We've got to remember it's still 
a a set of interrelationships between us and all the people in the team, and and there and each one of those is different. And I yeah. think that's that, that. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. No. No. It. It. it I, look. I am. I'm, I'm an avid reader of of business books, and I've many read many. But one that again, along with great, great, great that stuck with me it is um, the five dysfunctions of a team by yes. Patrick Lincoln. Yes. Have you read it? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, and and that whole pyramid of um of you know why there is dysfunctions in teams, and at the core of that pyramid, if you remember, is the absence of trust. Yeah. Yeah. That is yeah. the core reason why teams don't function. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. trust, trust the whole trust, and nothing but the trust is the, a phrase that I've coined about what is the most important thing in business, and how does that? And this is the been. But honestly, it's it's fascinating watching this because I must have been like this at a point in my career too, where what creates that lack of trust is the unwillingness or the inability, but mostly unwillingness, particularly with entrepreneurs, to display vulnerability. Yeah. 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 So if yeah. you display vulnerability regularly, people trust you. It's that simple. Yeah. If you don't, it's hard for people to trust you because they don't see a real person. They, it lacks authenticity. Nobody yes. can be great or have all the answers. It's just not possible. Yeah. Yep. So I'm an absolute class act at some things and I'm an absolute total <laughs> failure at others. <laughs> <I'm> snap. <laughs> but it's, and it's understand, it's, you know, it's understanding that, um, being honest with ourselves and others about that and then just filling the gaps, isn't it? Because once once we're clear that we have got vulnerabilities, let someone else do it. Because typically the stuff we're poor at is also the stuff we don't like. So, you know... Surround yourself with people who can cover your weak spots, yeah? yeah? And then polish your capabilities, your strengths to Olympian standards, yeah? But be vulnerable. Show people that you're not yeah. competent, yeah? Be vulnerable. It, it it's interesting. I, I, I'm just thinking about the. Uh, I think it was Brian Tracy talked about, and it's something we do a lot of long work with. It, is the best organisations are those where most people spend most of the time doing the three things they really love and they're really good at, and and you know move towards that by delegating stuff that we aren't. And I, I, it, it's interesting. And interesting. We, I think we come to similar things in different ways. But but your point about vulnerability is. Um, we, you know, we we consider ourselves growth specialists. We teach, we teach people to grow businesses and coach them to do so. Um, so therefore, we're selling in many ways success, and and it's balancing that with with the fact that yes, but we all make mistakes. And I often talk about you know my first business. We we had quite significant growth. We got to twelve million in thirteen years and and, and sold successfully um, to to a large corporate. But 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 I did hundred hour weeks for three years, and it pretty much broke me. And and it, it, you know, I, and yeah. there was a lot. Like I often say, there was a lot of luck. I mean, a massive amount. We were really clever guys, but a lot of luck. There was hard work, but a lot of luck. And, and have it. we all need it. Yeah, I, I, I really think. Yeah, I, and it's but it, and it's it's a bit of a balance there, though, uh, Stephen. I don't is that you know if we too. Yeah, I, I guess when we're selling success, the challenge is not to not to appear to be too too incompetent. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not a good idea for your coaching if it's not just really, all. No. <laughs> Here, here, I'm going to teach you how to be lucky. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I still buy into, no, but I do still buy into that very famous quote by um, Trevino. Yeah, when he was asked about why one of the masters, and he said, yes. "Well, the more I practice, the luckier I get." Uh, yes, hundred percent, and it's yeah, and, and that's that is the reality behind it. But it, but no, it's um, no, and we do have systems, so that's that's all good. Um, so. No, I'm really interested in this. Now, the other thing Jennifer Byrne said, if I might, I, I'm really keen to get your view, given given what you, what you've done previously and what you do now, is something she said. It really stuck with me. She and she said in the US, when um, they're recruiting C-suite executives, senior and, and C-suite, and these would be in large corporates, but I'm interested in how where you feel the overlap might be coming to SMEs. But one of the things they test them on is their ability not to do stuff, not to get involved in things and 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 i you know i i think that's a bit of a challenge for most S sme yeah. execs what I, I, I... right so that is at the core of our system okay right so we, okay. we we run a system called 
strategy on a page, yeah, so, yep. and it's absolutely as described. Yep. On one page, you have the three-year strategy for the business, okay? Yep. It has classic vision, mission, and then it has up to five strategic moves, the pillars of growth, yeah? Yep. You are not allowed to fucking move beyond those pillars. <laughs> that is the core message. <laughs> right, brilliant. No shiny stuff allowed unless <laughs> we've proven that the last growth move is now either fully embedded or didn't work. Then you have to practice planned abandonment, yeah, which is that stuff that you start will not always work and you have to yep. abandon it because when you leave it out there in the ether, it's messy, yeah, yep. it's messy. So we very much believe what Jennifer says is that you've got, I mean, the whole thing about strategy is it's about choice. And if you have too many choices, you haven't got a strategy. That's just mayhem. Yep. Yeah. And the problem in SME is much more profound on that issue than it is with large corporates because large corporates are much tend to be much more about following a plan. Yeah. Whereas in SME, yep. that is so much more difficult. It is the core. If you ask any entrepreneur, there's one thing that we teach them that they actually hate, but will tell us is the best thing that they've learned from us is that that's it. Stick to the soap. Yeah, brilliant. I I, I I remember somebody using the acronym FOCUS a long time ago, which I really quite like. And it was, fi FOCUS was fixed on course until successful. Yeah. I thought was was, was a nice way yeah. of looking at it. Um, You know, I, I, yeah. Providing we're monitoring that it's, it's going the right direction. So uh, you, you're probably, I think from our discussion already, but you're probably where we're at a business coaching organisation, that's what we do, Stephen. I'm keen to know who the best coaches you've worked with before, whether that's business, sports, or life in general. Yeah, look, in terms of business coaching through actually meeting people, not necessarily those who are um, I'd employed to coach me or were my bosses, I was very fortunate to meet a lot of very successful people who just, right. having met them, yeah, you learn from, yeah? Just small things, so I'm yep. going to name drop. For example, I'll go with the big one. I met Bill Clinton. Wow, wow. Very fortuitously when I was at HSBC. Um, and, you know, just things that he said to me have stuck with me. I met a guy called Alan Layton, who was probably the very first senior corporate pluralist. Yeah, right. he was previously chief exec of ASDA. Um, yes. He then he came out and he, he was chairman of Pandora. Um, yeah. he, um, he, he was chairman of the post office. Very famous pluralist. But he said to me at a dinner um, something that stuck with me, which is, you see, people make business very complicated, he said. And over the years, I've simplified it to the following statement. Business is 20% strategy thinking about shit. Yeah, yeah. It's 80% execution, doing stuff. And then communication is the bridge between the two. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And he said, that, if you want my recipe for business, is it. Yeah, I right. make sure that I've got the four-fifths, one-fifths recipe right. Yeah? yeah. Because you can have too much thinking and not enough doing. Or yeah, equally, okay. you can have all doing and not enough clarity of thinking. Yeah. yeah. But once you've got that mix right, if you don't get the comms to link between the two, you never get full traction. And so yeah. that's very important. But I'm going to finish by saying the best business coach of my entire life, and I think we talked about it before we went on record, was my yeah. mother. Yeah? yeah. Because had it not been for my mother, I would have never had the drive and the push to get out of the council estate in Glasgow. And I hold, hold her a massive debt of gratitude. She didn't know she was coaching me. She did it through love. But it's yes. been the best coaching I've ever received. Wonderful. Wonderful. What a great, yeah, w w wonderful thing to say. Um, and and, and um, we talked a little bit about quote. You've, you've obviously mentioned one of the quotes. Are there any other quotes? You've, you've mentioned one or two already, but any other quotes or sayings that come to mind? Or yeah, I'm going to use one of mine, yeah. And uh, I have to say, it's oh, the, yeah. only, the only piece of wisdom I've ever imparted on the world that I, don't, I think uh, my, my colleague, Mr. Nifsi, actually uses this the only thing he's ever listened to me about as well and it's this 
people manage in business and generally, but I think I'm very much talking, I don't have much expertise in life, um, but I've got some expertise in business. People manage for yesterday's conditions because yesterday is where they got their experiences from. But leadership isn't about yesterday. It's about tomorrow. And that is all about this. I think you said earlier before we went on about uh, there's a book. Um, but what got you? What was it? What got you? Yeah, what got you here won't get you there. Um... Yeah. And that is absolutely that statement for me is always be evolving. Yeah. And if you're operating at the same pace you were in the same way that you were last year and the world is look at look at the world now. You know, if you were, I read an article by Matthew Syed and he was saying if you took the whole history of mankind and you had a thousand years for each page and you had a hundred pages, that's the history of man, right? Yeah. But in the first 999 pages, what would it say? Nothing. Nothing changed. Yeah. yeah. But in yeah. the last thousand years, yeah, that last page, yeah, yes. look at the level of change. And then look at the last 10 years. Yeah. And look at it. And so the amount of change that's happening now in mankind relative to the mankind change that took place for 99.9% .9 of it. But are we actually all in business changing to keep up with that? I certainly am. I'm not. It's very hard. It's very hard. I I remember being told uh, uh, that um, Tony Benn, uh, Anthony Wedgwood Benn, when he retired from, from, from politics in general, he, he, that he would go and speak at a lot of... Um, a lot of universities they they got him to speak and apparently he used to start every every speech every presentation of these students with we all wake we all wake up in the morning knowing less knowing less than we did yesterday and 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 of course all the academics say you can't <laughs> do that funny, yeah but but yeah I mean, the point was there's so much more information in the world every day that our percentage of it is actually reducing over time and it's yeah and, and I, I agree it's um, I, I guess there's a a question mark of how how much you try to keep up and how much you just say right this is my this is my niche this is my bit and I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on that and make that as good it could, as good as it could be. Yeah, yeah, my, I'm gonna I've, I've got one other which yep. I, I adore and it's completely nothing to do with business, but it is absolutely about business, which is and I'm never quite sure exactly what the words are, but it's in the Serengeti, yeah, whether you're a lion or a gazelle, yeah. If you're the fastest lion or the slowest lion or the slowest, because when you wake up in the morning and the sun comes up, you better be you better be running. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't matter which one you are, you've still no. got to be running. Yeah. And yeah. and I honestly, even now at my tender age of, of 56, I am still so driven when I get up in the morning. Yeah. And I want to keep running as long yeah. as I can. There'll be a time when I can't run as fast as I do now. But for as long as I can, I'm just going to keep running. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and and on that note, a little bit, what what would you say you've learned most about yourself throughout your journey in your career? Um, the biggest thing I've learned, and I didn't know it, is resilience. Yeah, and and yeah. I have I also with resilience, I have I think I've got very very good bounce back ability. Yeah. Um, and you know you need it because you're going to fail. Yeah. I have failed on numerous occasions. And, and I'm not saying that for, for to be trite. I genuinely have some quite yeah. catastrophic failures. Yeah. 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 I, and it, two things. One, it's how do you learn? And it's how do you then dust yourself down and go again? And I see people who haven't got that resilience. And I, 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 I really do worry about it for, for generationally for the kids that are yes. coming through. I do genuinely worry about it that... We, we've we've not educated. Yes, our, our, when I grew up, it was it was wrong. Thanks, not everything was right. Some things were wrong, and you know, just got on with it. And you know, all of that wasn't necessarily perfect. But I think we've lost some of that resilience as we teach yeah. kids. Yeah, and and yes. then and the ability to just constantly bounce back. So that's yeah. my that's my life's lesson. Brilliant, brilliant. And I I think with you know I, I talk to quite a lot of people about resilience, and there's obviously a few things that that contribute, but. I, Personally, I feel it's very important that we celebrate in the good times to build, it, you know, the, the analogy being a bank account. If you put stuff in there, then when it comes to time to withdraw because we've had a problem, we've got something in the account. If we've not, if, and, and also people are so poor at celebrating. I, I don't know yeah. if you find that with yourself or and other people you work with, but entrepreneurs are always typically looking at what, what's yet to be done rather than what they've achieved. Yeah, and, and, and I must confess that I'm guilty of that. Um, <laughs> Not enjoying the journey, 
as yeah. much because I'm constantly searching for the next and better destination. Yeah. Yes. So I, I, I do. I, I um, a friend of mine, a guy called Philip Hesketh, who's a very, very well-renowned speaker on persuasion influence, and he told me several years ago that he was speaking in New Zealand at a dinner, and I think I think the guy who was the main guest was a guy. I think he's the first guy to have climbed Everest with two artificial limbs. Oh and, um, and you know, so you know, how driven is this guy? And and um, Philip said that over dinner, he said, well, when you know, when you got to the top of Everest, so you're the first man ever to do this. You you know you are unique in that or not unique. You're at that point you're unique. You'll, you'll always be in history as the first man to have done that. Um, what did it feel like? And and apparently this guy said something like, um, I had two two minutes, let's say two or three minutes of absolute adulation. I made it. I, I'm successful. And then he said, then I thought, what's next? And I sort of think, can we not extend it a little bit? <laughs> it's like, no, that that, but that's that is the that's the power of 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 achievement and, and positive mental attitude. I can never remember this guy's name. We had him as a speaker at a corporate event, and he was a seven time Olympian, Paralympian. Yeah, yes. he got cancer in his leg at seventeen, and he was a swimmer. Yeah, so he had one artificial limb. But in the four by four relay, I hadn't understood this, but. It's a it's a mix of overall disability to one overall scored disability. So you can yes. make that you can make that four up every way you want. Yeah. 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 But the 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 um the perceived wisdom is that you went out with your um last was your best swimmer. Yeah. So yeah. you went out in the order of weakest up to yeah. best. Yeah. Okay? I'll come back to that, but it was really to your point there about the Everest guy. So he shows us a video of them receiving their medal at the previous Olympics, silver medal, lost to the Australians. Nobody could beat this Australian quartet. They were yeah. unbeaten. Okay? Yeah. And that was their advantage because everybody yeah. thought yes. they were unbeaten. Yeah. So he shows us this video of them getting their medals and then stops it and says, now in that video is why we didn't win. Not in the, not the race. Doesn't yeah, show yeah, yeah. Them. yeah. And we're yeah. all like, what? Nobody guessed it. Do you want to have a go? I I, well, I will have a go. I'm thinking they're celebrating getting silver. So two people, him and another guy, have got faces like thunder. Right. Yeah. yeah. The other two are over the moon. Yeah. 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 And he said, you cannot win when two yeah. people are happy with silver. Okay. Yeah. Fast forward to the next Olympics. Yeah. Same, same quartet bar one. So they... Kept one of those two, yep. changed one. Same Australian quartet, they're yep. still unbeatable. Until one hour before the race, which is when you have to announce your team order, the Australians expected us to do the considered wisdom, but they didn't. He, as the strongest swimmer, came out first. Ooh. And they got such a lead after the first 100 that the Australians were beaten. Well, wow, well, wow. because you just saw the gap and believed each of those next three swimmers believed they couldn't make it up, and each of them swam slower than they ordinarily were capable of doing yeah. because psychologically they had beaten them. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that, that that's about. I, I'm not aware of that story, and it's a fantastic. So I'll I'll I'll, I'll search that that up. It, it it the two things come to mind. One is the the classic. Um, Henry Ford quote, you know, whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. And, and, yeah. yeah. But the other one was a sto story Sir Clive Woodward talked about, which is very simple, it was an Olympic story. When, when, And he was talking about, and I, I didn't know this had happened either, was the um, it was the Chinese diving team, duo team, the synchronised diving yeah. team, and they were similarly 10 points ahead of everybody else. They were, they just literally needed to sort of plop into the water on the last dive, and they, they won. And apparently there was, I think it was in, Anyway, I'm not going to go where it was. Um, this a protester came out, apparently wearing a tutu, and sat on the little the the, the, the bouncy ball, <laughs> and was a security risk because nobody knew. I think he was just a bit of a nutter, but 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 he sat there, and they uh, for whatever reason the security didn't feel comfortable to go and grab him, so he sat there for a long time, and they suspended the the event for a couple of hours in the end, and the and and they sent these Chinese guys who were just about to dive back to their changing rooms, and evidently they didn't have any sort of structure what if scenarios they planned and they probably spent all their time sitting in their desk room thinking what happens if we get it wrong 
because evidently they came out and got it wrong. And that, so I know Clavel has got this idea, this this concept of teacup or think correctly under pressure, we, we, and it's based on let's imagine what might go wrong and let's have a strategy for each one of those things. Yeah, if, yeah. You know, you know, could be, and, and and I guess our founder Brad Sugars has always said to me that the value of a plan is in the planning, i.e. Yeah. That's how we want it to go, but the, if it goes wrong in this way, what would we do? If it goes wrong in that way, what would we do? Yeah, they um, call that, I think that's now in business parlance, is called a pre-mortem. Yes, yes, yes. So funny, I heard that phrase just recently. Yeah, pre-mortem. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah what could have been the reason it, it, it all went yeah, so, so, yeah. And I think that's something I, I've not done enough of, is I love a new growth pillar, yeah? A new yeah. winning move. But it's sitting down and just forcing yourself with the mentality to list all the shit that could go wrong with that, yeah? And then yeah. and then just have that cognitive thinking about, okay, what might we do under those circumstances? But if you have those pre-mortems, the golden rule, as I understand it, is to ensure that the answer is not to say no, yeah? Because it's yes. very easy to have a pre-mortem system where everybody just says, oh, wow. Look at all the things that could go wrong. I might as well not bother. I mean, that's life in general. You wouldn't uh, get up in the morning if you listed absolutely. all the things that could really go wrong. We're going to succeed because we know what might go wrong and we've got a fix for everyone. I, I, 100%. You, that, there is that danger, isn't there, if we start thinking about everything that could be, absolutely. Could be going wrong. It's like, well, why the hell would you want to do it in the first place? But then if, if that happened, we'd never do anything. You're, you're right. absolutely... So, so Sting, what, what, I mean, looking forward... What what's the future look like for you guys, and and what what are the main challenges you face, if any? So yeah, you know, we've got lots of challenges. They're always around. I mean, right now the biggest challenge has been the it has been the economic environment. Yeah, yeah, and um, it creates the perception in everyone's minds, both in our businesses and the people we sell to, that that sentiment is is negative. Budgets are less. That's just a fact. Yeah. Um, and so we need to be better, and that's both a challenge and an opportunity because. If you've actually got a really cool economy, you don't necessarily need to get better. But but it comes back to people. We need always better talent. That's better existing talent trained more effectively. So that training is absolutely, and coaching is crucial. And we don't do enough of that. That's new more and the businesses that we're in because we're all too busy. So that's definitely yeah. an yeah. issue and an opportunity. And, and, and upgrading talent is, is constantly a, a challenge. The market for debt is a challenge, right? I mean, you know, it's got more expensive, significantly yep. more expensive. That, that, that's a, a, a problem that keeps us up at night. Um, and, and I suppose the, the, the constant challenge for us is not taking on too much, yeah? Because yep. we're, we are, you know, we love business. We love new opportunities. We love buying companies. We just got to be careful that we don't take on too much, Yeah. Um, yeah. And we got to. We also got to practice, and you know, in the in the audience business that you've interviewed some of the execs before. Yes. We had US business, um, which was really set up as a precursor to doing a buy and build in the United States. And because yeah. of the economy, we didn't do the buy and build in the United States. Right. We left the US office open, and we left it open too long. Yeah. Right. Because we didn't want to give up. Because we don't yeah. like giving up. Yeah. Nope. And I didn't practice <laughs> planned abandonment. Um, as I would profess that other people should. So, I, you know, I, th those are the things that you've just got to be careful. You don't, what, what less is more. It's been uh, around for years, that saying, but I do think it's true. And, yeah. I, and I'm guilty sometimes of having too much. I also, I'm a risk taker. And sometimes I just see too much of the upside and not enough of the downside. Yeah. Yeah, yeah which, but, you know, that's, we need a whole bunch of that, don't we? We just got to do that little bit of, a, bit, yeah. a little bit of um, checking and, and, and making sure everything works. You, there, there's the there's the, the premise of the empty chair. Have you, yeah? No, no, I'm not. I'm not the empty that. chair is that there's a particular characteristic that you don't have in a group of people in business that you need somebody to fill that empty chair. So Amazon's empty chair is the customer. Yeah? Yeah, yeah. So the customer sits in the boardroom and it yeah. literally actually is an empty chair. Yeah? Yeah every board meeting and that's them talking to the customer. Nice. Yes. And so I think in entrepreneur land, often the empty chair is prudence. Yeah. 
Yeah, I get that. I really do. I think it's a, it's that taking a walk, isn't it? Okay, well, look, let's let, let's imagine we were risk averse. What, what what might we be worried about? And and yeah. and sort of yeah, that makes that makes a lot. You of have sense. to be careful though that prudence doesn't then become negativity. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. It, it's a such, fine line. It's a very fine line, isn't it? And it's um yeah, I'd, but it it but it but but necessary necessary and and. Stephen, you know, what would you say to anyone that was thinking of going into business right now? Look, unless you come up with a medical technology that's going to change the world, and some do, yeah, I tried it, didn't do very well. Um, but there are two things that I don't think are removable from the recipe of going into business. One is that you're going to have to take risks and you're going to have to work really damn hard, yeah? And there is no... There's just no way around that. Yeah, you can't yeah. make up for it by incredible brilliance and great minds. Um, and it, so at the core of that then is what we call brilliant basics. Because what really makes a business successful, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, is a set of basic actions and principles that if you consistently do, going back to good to great, that the flywheel starts to move. That... Brilliant basics. They're nothing sexy about them. They're dull, monotonous, boring actions and activities. But those build up systematically to give you the momentum of the flywheel that drives businesses successfully. And unfortunately, that's where a lot of people fail because they're looking for the quick fix. They're looking for the silver bullet. Call it whatever you will. But in our experience, in my experience, those brilliant basics are what drives business success. And the minute you stop doing them, and we see this where we coach in our um, entrepreneurial operating system and they use that system and they work hard at the system and the system start to deliver results and then they believe that they don't need the system. The very thing that's driven the result, they stop doing because they believe that it wasn't really the system. They've now got it cracked. <laughs> Sorry, I'm laughing. Sorry, I can, I can emphasize. Yeah, I can, uh, I, uh, yes, no, I get uh, Yeah, I, it's, it's, it's it's nuts, but it's part of that entrepreneur. It's it's got it is a big part of that entrepreneurial character, isn't it? I I I know clients that I've worked with, and you know they they we we achieve the success they want, and then they think that is you exactly what you just said. They think they don't need need you any, not need you anymore, but but it's almost like but we've got here because of this, and yeah. and um, got to keep doing it every single day, right? I mean, yeah, terrible analogy, but you can't. If you're an alcoholic, you can't just every now and again start drinking. Yeah. No. You've just got to stop. Well, when you yeah. start the system, you can't stop it because yeah. those brilliant basics are. Absolutely. What you it. And, the, and the other thing I would say is talk less and do more. Yeah. That's, I think that's very sound, very, very sound advice. I think, you know, go back to, I think it's Jim Rohn very much talks about success is a, 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 a handful of decisions and actions consistently done every day absolutely compared to a handful of, of not done every day and it's literally you know there is a it, it's not some massive change it's just these simple things do them consistently and you you'll get where you want to go yeah we we i mean just a one very quick point on our, and yeah. our us our us system which is our scaling system works on the premise of two axes the first axis is is this particular action and it's across a balanced scorecard yeah is this particular action in place, yes or no? And it's binary, okay? That's one part of the score. The other yeah. part of the score, which is much more subjective, is is this action that's in place, if it is, is yeah. it fully effective? And fully effective yeah. is defined by us, is would you score it eight or more out of 10, right? So yeah. if, you're, if you're at six, it might be okay, but it's not fully effective. It's in place, but it's not fully yeah. effective. You, yeah. you basically the score, is multiplied by the in place by the fully effective. So the yeah. overall target score for great is 63%. Yeah. That's 90% okay. in place, 70% fully effective. And I don't know a business that if they've got 63% in our scoring system, isn't smashing it. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. That, yeah. And, and, and it yeah, makes absolute sense. And it's that, as you said, it's that focus of do the simple things. It, it, I find it really interesting myself because I work with different different sizes of business, different scales of business. And, and you know, we, we, we operate in the sort of SME world, but I've also worked with some larger organisations. And one thing that came to mind was 
and working with some of the, the larger ones, we were getting over 100 people, was it felt like you actually going back to basics was really valuable. It's almost like they forgot the basics. So going back, I guess it's going back to your previous point of they'd forgotten the stuff that got them there as well as, uh, as you sort of, and, you know, basics around behaviours, values, um, having sets of vision, values and purpose, all those things that sort of got lost in the, in, in the wash and um, doing the, and it was really strange to be doing really what felt like basic stuff with large organisations, but massive, you know, massive results and changes. Yeah, yeah, and, and we 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 believe in the the premise of performance. Performance management is a, a an oft used phrase, right? But what actually is it? And it means many different things to different people. But in our world, it's the alchemy of leadership with management. Okay, yes, it's that balance between the two, and yeah. you know, we call them lefties. And righties, yeah. Right. Lefties yeah. are the leaders, and, and our, our lefty methodologies are around envisioning, inspiring, and educating. Yeah, yeah. And then the righties are the tough, grunty managers. Yeah, and it's about monitoring, about following up, and about taking exception where necessary. Yeah, yeah. And if you have an overt right culture, you've got a problem. If you've got an overt left yeah. culture, you've yeah. got equally a problem. And yep. it's about that alchemy between manage, management and leadership, lefties and righties, that is, in our view, the definition of what performance management is about. Yeah. Yeah, that that, that resonates a lot. We, um, Our founder, brother, was very keen to differentiate, He's very similar to you, the difference between leadership and management. And one of his beliefs were, then that, that, that going back to sort of five, six years ago, was that the business world had moved much more towards being leaders. And he, he evidenced it in a in a room of about 1,500 people. And he said, you know, who, who are the leaders in the room? And, you know, 80% put their hands up. And who are the managers? And about 20% put their hands up. You know, and, and it was like, well, hold on, guys. Yeah, we, we obviously leadership's important. We've got to get stuff done too. We, we need to inspire. Yeah. We need to, but we need to get shit done. Because if we don't get shit done, it's not, you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. And, well, that comes back to, to, um, the recipe I was given earlier by Alan Layton, which is I would say that what he was really saying was that in, in the strategy, which is where much of the leadership is, yeah, is is only one fifth of the time formula. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So what are you going to be doing with the other four fifths? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I, I, yeah. Yeah, it's really fa absolutely fascinating. Uh, um, just, yeah. So um, if you if you were to start a yeah, Stephen, is there anything that significant you think you'd do differently? Yeah, I would make better and quicker people decisions. You know, this is a theme that's come out of this all the way yes. through. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. Yeah, I would all I I think I think my what I would say is that the minute that your your brain and your gut are telling you you need to make a people decision, it's already too late. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Because there's yes. something in there's something been telling you that for a, a long time. And one of the, the things that helped me with that was a letter that I received from somebody I made a people decision on to fire a person yeah, in corporate. And this chap was a great branch manager in HSBC. Um, and we promoted him to area director. And like often the best salesperson isn't the best manager. It yep. isn't true that the best branch manager turns out to be the best area director. Okay. Yes. It turned out he wasn't. So I sat him down, and this was a guy I'd known for many, many years. And I said, Mark, you have two options. He didn't. The option one is you go back to being the branch manager. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or the option two is you're off. Yeah. Yeah. And he left. And he sent me a letter three years later, and it made me cry. And I, I, I don't know where it is. I should try and find it. But it, it said to the words to the effect he was a very, very accomplished guitarist. And he'd never really looked to pursue his real passion. Oh, wow. Well. And he ended up being, and still is today, one of the most successful success, um, uh, session guitarists. Not, he's, not, uh, he's not a star. Yeah, he's a no, session no, yeah. Yeah. guitarist. Yeah. Yeah. And he does it with some of the biggest in the business. And he wow. wrote me the letter that basically thanked me from the bottom of his heart for sacking him. Wow. Wonderful. Wonderful. And... I, no, I think it's wonderful. And I, I would suggest um, 
you know, clearly the way you did it was with respect because that's, you know, the, the, the fact that he thanked you for it. Um, I think it's how we treat people is really key, isn't it? It was the right decision, but it was also you did it in a way that, that they helped him. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't have got that letter, I'd suggest. I know. No, it was, it, no I mean, it was, it's, it's, but the point really is, is that when you're making a people decision and somebody isn't right for the business or they're not right for that job, don't think about it simply from the point of view of the business. Think about it from the point of view of the individual. I had never done that till I received that letter. I thought I was just doing the right thing for the business. Yeah. Yes. I actually now found out that in many cases that is doing the right thing for the person. Yeah. I think it was Jack Welsh who said, if you can't fire someone, yeah, you're a bad manager. But if you enjoy firing yeah. someone, you're a really bad person. Yeah. 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 I agree. And, and and something came to mind. I'm sure the one was. Um, I, I I believe. I mean, I really do believe. If we if we're in a team where everyone or even the individual has a great attitude, and I suspect I'm, you know, from what you said, this person probably did. Then yeah, they did. know if they, they know if they're not performing. So it's not like you're telling them something they don't know because they will be aware of it. So you know, it, it's the right for them too. They, nobody wants to work do a bad job with people with great attitude. They don't want to do a bad job. And if they know they're doing it, then he hated it because he yeah. was very successful in his previous life as a yes. manager, manager yeah. and he hated not feeling that success, but he didn't want to admit it. He did. He yeah. wasn't going to come to me and say, I'm failing, I'm out, right? Because yeah. it was just too big. And he was, you know, very yeah. set in ways. Didn't have the, he didn't have the, I think he would say, he didn't have the balls to go and do what ultimately my yeah. decision, my decision forced Helped him to do. Wonderful. Yeah? Great story, wonderful stories. It, and again, it, 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 it stuck yeah, with me. Was... Now, when I make a people decision, I don't sit, think, "Oh, I'm making a bad decision for this person." Right? Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. Brilliant. Well, look, last question. Uh, we have to be faster. I could talk all day, but but uh, I'm sure we both need to do things. What What would be the best advice you could give an 18 year old you, Stephen, if you could go back in time and do so? Yeah, that that's a, that's an interesting one. Um, I mean, is I would say that I should have had in my earlier career, Stephen, I'm talking to myself, the balls and the belief that I should have been an entrepreneur sooner. Yeah. Um, because it's where I'm now, and I think I get much more enjoyment out of this part of my career than I did in corporate. I would obviously say that had I not had the corporate career that I did, for the most part, very successful, but there were some big mistakes. Um, then I wouldn't have been able to have built the career we've got now, because as you can imagine, we leverage our CVs in the capacity of buying businesses. People look at our backgrounds and say they, you know, they, they know stuff. Whether it's the right stuff or not, they know stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but but no, I, I still think I would tell myself, back yourself to have gone into business. Not because I would have been financially better off. I might have been, but because I think I would have had a more enjoyable career. Not that I didn't enjoy my time in corporate, but I much more enjoy my time in, in entrepreneur land. It's fascinating. Um, and maybe it wouldn't be as fascinating if I'd have been one of those entrepreneurs. It's because I now look at them from the perspective of not being one of them. And I admire so much their attributes that I didn't have. I could never have done what many of them have done is, you know, started from scratch all those years ago with nothing. And I did it later in life, started with yeah. nothing and rebuilt. But that's because I had a lot of substance behind me. Yeah. Yes. In many of these guys' cases, in girls' cases, they didn't have any of this. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I admire that greatly. But I, yeah, I would definitely have become an entrepreneur much earlier. Brilliant. Brilliant, great. I also great. say, listen to your mum and dad. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All those kids, yeah. There, yeah. listen to your mum and dad because they do. <laughs> I think that's sound advice for, for for anyone really. And 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 just finally, um, Stephen, thank you so. I say thank you so much for your time. If anyone's watching would like to get in touch with you uh, or your business, we, we, which would what would be the best way to do? I so? doubt it. I doubt it very much. But if they if they do oh. it, it's Stephen with a ph at Newmore Capital N E W. M O R E capital, the word capital.com. Stephen at newmorecapital.com. Wonderful. 
Well, again, thank you so much for your time this morning. It's been really fascinating. Very well, really it. thank you. Maybe we can catch, catch, catch up again in six, 12 months just to see what, 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 what's happening. Absolutely. Before. That's been fabulous. I really enjoyed it. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you.